Matt, thanks so much for joining me on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. How are you doing over there? I am doing great. Uh, we're celebrating in the United States, it's called Memorial Day. Uh, and that's actually where you remember all the dead in all the wars. Right. Um, and it's it started after the Civil War where um, we lost an incredible amount of Americans because it was all Americans fighting. And um, so they started this holiday to remember the dead. And it was very solemn on both sides. Um, so I can imagine uh, yeah. it's it's become sort of our service holiday, too. It's where you recognize people for military service. And and um, so, yeah, it's, it's it was great weekend. And uh, we had good weather yesterday. Today it rained, rained some. I was actually grilling in the rain oh, with wow. an umbrella over the, <laughs> the yeah, but uh, it all worked out. It's all sunny right. now, though. You can tell the sun in, in my office. Right, right. Well, it, look, it's beautiful light, and I uh, really appreciate you joining us because I want to talk about one of these issues that affects everybody around the world in the 21st century more than ever before and answer a question that I've received a lot, which is if people, essentially what they call nofap, will they get better memory? And it's a obviously a, one of the key things that people are going to point their finger at if they're not able to focus, not able to concentrate, and not able to use the memory techniques. And I couldn't think of anyone that I wanted to ask more than you. So what it, what's your take on all of this? And you know, maybe for people who are new to, to you and what you do, just uh, give us the, the rundown on what we need to remember about, about you and your work. Well, you know, you reached out to me and, and it's probably because I host the Porn Free Radio podcast and Porn Free Radio is for motivated guys who want to quit looking at porn and it's a lot about hope and and giving people kind of options for recovery and then also teaching them, you know, methods similar to you, you know, the way you teach uh, memory um, encoding, the way you t teach some of your skills, it's the same type of thing. I'm helping guys create self-care skills to eliminate porn from their lives. And a lot of guys describe it as an addiction. Other guys describe it as a bad habit that they keep doing. And I don't have to make a distinction right. in order to help them because the, the, the course out is the same. Usually there's some needs they're trying to meet um, or there's something they're escaping from uh, in porn. And, and I try to help them walk out of it and start to replace those habits uh, with healthy habits that actually restore them. Now, how do you, you asked this uh, when we were talking earlier, how did I get into this work? And it was really simple. I um, struggled with porn for about 30 years of my life. And it was something I never felt pr good about. I didn't feel like it really modeled the type of man I wanted to be. It it, uh, I had a conflict morally with it because of my Christian faith. But uh, even if I didn't have a, uh, a moral conflict with it, it was controlling me. I was compulsively going towards it uh, despite some of the consequences that it affected uh, me and my confidence. And then later when I got into marriage, it affected uh, my marriage. My wife obviously was very upset by my porn use and and um, and I really wanted recovery in order to to grow in intimacy with my relationship with her. So a lot of what I've learned came from my own experience. Um, and um, so you had a question about nofap, right? Right. I mean, what is it anyway? I I think many people will know that term, but uh, there's a, obviously a story behind it. Yeah, well, fapping is a euphemism for masturbating. And uh, a few years ago, maybe about, it might be about 10 years ago now, um, a group of guys on Reddit formed a thread called NoFap. And it was basically uh, a number of guys had, you know, were exploring the idea of if, if they gave up masturbating or if they gave up porn and porn behaviors, um, would their life get better? Because I think, I think it was kind of a, a response to, you know, broadband internet came out in 2004, right. you know, uh, iPhones became pretty popular in the late, 
uh, 2000, uh, maybe 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, so you had kind of this, these two events where, um, you know, the ability to see high speed video, uh, on your home computer, um, you know, like YouTube and things like that, that all happened in the broadband era and then smartphones came right after it. And I think what ended up happening is more and more people were getting dependent on porn and, and, you know, porn goes hand in hand with masturbation. And so, uh, I think people have been masturbating for forever. So that's not a new thing, but I think the level of, uh, uh, of masturbation activity and porn activity increased with the the accessibility of broadband internet videos things like that and so nofap kind of came as a response to that it was a bunch of guys going hey let's try to figure out are there ways that we can get control of this because you know it's leading to these consequences and one of the big consequences people describe is having some sort of erectile dysfunction it's not a physical erectile dysfunction, uh, like you would have if you had a you know a chemical imbalance in your body, it's more of a stimulation problem. Um, guys are hyper stimulated by looking at lots of very stimulating porn, and then when they're with a partner, having intimacy with a partner, they're just not getting stimulated. It's not arousing this at the same level. Hmm. And so it's, it's, so it feels sort of like, I think, erectile dysfunction. Now, whether it's physically there's a problem or not, um, or whether it's due to, you know, excessive masturbation, I'm not sure of the science of it. But that was one of the sort of um, anecdotal things that people talked about is, man, I can't get an erection when I'm with a partner. And I think it's because of my porn and masturbation. Right. So that, you know is probably something that is going to be a case by case, uh, situation that people need to, to work on. What about the general experience that you've had yourself and with working with people in terms of things like not just performance, so to speak with a a partner, but just other areas of life, like concentration, focus, are there, stories uh, and even research that shows that people have improved in these areas or that they they were harming themselves in these areas in the first place? Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd be more qualified to talk about consequences. So some of the big consequences that people describe are um, lack of focus. Um, they're using porn to procrastinate or to deal with anxiety. Right. And it ends up... Um, distracting them from doing the work they need to do. Um, in other cases, guys describe um, a, a lack of confidence. Here, here's what happens when you're struggling with a habit like porn. Um, usually, if, if you're in conflict about what you're doing, you try to stop. You resolve to stop. Right. But because porn is very powerful and because it's tied to sexual orgasm, and, you know, there's obviously an allure to it. Um, it's hard for guys to stop. And so what happens is after a couple of these cycles of where a guy binges and then tries to resolve to stop and then goes back to it, there's a real loss of confidence and a, and a lack of trust for self. Right. And, and that seed, that sort of, underlying feeling like you can't follow through or you can't uh, do this this task starts to leak into other areas, whether it's work, whether it's school, whether it's giving a presentation, whether it's having a, a conversation at a coffee shop with a woman or someone of the opposite sex. Right. There's this there's this diminished sense of confidence because of this repeated uh, experience of failure. So, um, and, uh, one thing that, you know, you and I've talked about before is there's also, because there's such a compulsive part of this, there's a a real sense of, uh, an inability to delay any gratification. Right. Um, so what's happening is whenever some, someone who's struggling experiences a negative feeling or doesn't, you know, an uncomfortable situation, stress, anxiety, boredom, 
they get really used to the habit of going immediately to this porn thing. And, and that's just a hard way to go through life where, you know, every emotion, every bad thing that happens, even a good thing, a powerful good thing that happens right. will sometimes be a trigger for guys. And so it has a, um, a real impact on confidence, on an ability to delay gratification. Focus kind of comes in, in terms of just constantly being distracted by it. It also takes over uh, a good deal of obsessive thinking. Mm. Um, there's a lot of craving that happens when you're constantly engaging uh, with a behavior addiction. Your mind starts to, to think about it when you're not when you're not doing it. Right. Your mind's like thinking, when can I get back to it? Right. Uh, so yeah. let's say you were let, let's say you were doing memory work, but you were not dealing with your behavioral addiction. Your mind at some point would be, man, I'm sick of doing this memory palace work. I want to go back onto my computer. You know? Right, right. Well, yeah, I'm glad you raised this notion of delayed gratification because that's what reading a book is, right? It's delaying your gratification till the book is done. And then if you're using memory techniques all, all along the way, well, this is a kind of form of, of mental activity that can help you focus more. But if your focus is constantly being interrupted by the need for some gratification that you've wired into yourself, then you know you got multiple battles that you're fighting that that just don't really need to be there. And I like how you mentioned you know these thoughts coming into into your mind. If you're a student or just a, a mature learner who is a lifelong student, you don't you want to be thinking about the stuff you're studying, not have these intrusive thoughts of. Uh, of you know some urge to go and 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 do something so i like that point about delayed gratification what are some tips and strategies that anybody can do to put their you know their boot in the door of of stopping that from hijacking them and uh derailing their study efforts or their learning efforts well i love the word you said hijack that's a word i use a lot that you know, guys will um, have the intention to to not, not look at porn, and then they'll come home to an empty house and their partner isn't there, and so many years of associating an empty house or an empty apartment with a behavior that's tied to orgasm, that's tied to this sort of very hyper-stimulating uh, content, um, what happens is the moment that the the guy gets home, there's this trigger that gets sort of almost Pavlovian trigger mm. that occurs when they walk into the empty house. Right. And and so um, so one of the first things that I like to try to do is to help guys see some of these patterns. Right. Um, th that it's that there is sort of an invisible script that they're following. Um, and sometimes it's due to associations. Sometimes it's due to mistaken beliefs. Um, you know, they've 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 decided that porn is a good substitute for their sex life or intimacy, or porn is a good thing to do when they're stressed out, or porn's a good thing to do when they're alone. And a lot of times we try to get down to what's the truth of that? Is this, is is this how you want to spend your time when you're alone? Right. Or are you compulsively doing it because you've cultivated this habit over the years, this extreme version of a habit? And so if a guy, when I talk to them, is saying, hey, I don't want to be compulsively looking at this alone. I don't feel good about it. This isn't helping intimacy in my marriage. So that's the first thing. It's like to acknowledge and figure out, well, what, what's your why for doing this? What are some of the costs that you're experiencing? Right. Um, and as we do that, we start to try to figure out what kind of life do you want to create? Like, what is what would it look like? And getting them to visualize what what it would look like. And, and then starting to look at, well, what are some of the tools that we can use to deal with the threats in your life? You know, what are, you know, the situation of like the guy who comes home to the, the empty house. I, I worked with a guy once who, um, you know, that was kind of his thing. You know, he, he really struggled when he was alone, if his wife or his kids were out of the house. 
And um, so we were trying to help him come up with some habits. I was trying to help him come up with some habits and think about things that would stimulate him, things that he would get some energy from. You know, you and I both love uh, – uh, well, okay, I'm going to try to say the name now. You, you've you've encoded this. All right. But it's uh, the work of Mihai Csikszent Mihai. Is Csikszent Mihai. Right? Yeah. Csikszent Mihai. <laughs> right. I'm not Mihai even sure. Csikszent I'm not even sure. It's probably like my last name, where there 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 is no like written code where this is the correct pronunciation. But uh, I think it's Mihai Csikszent Mihai. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. So Mihai uh, Chiksit Mihai, uh, known to his friends as Mike, um, literally, that's true. Uh, he wrote a book called Flow. And this is the kind of his, uh, his psychology of optimal experience. And what he did was he measured a lot of people, how they performed at work. Right. That was his first interest is how do people get things done? How do people follow through on goals? You know, where do employees get stuck? You know, that was kind of his questioning, his main research. And out of it, he came up with this concept of flow. And the idea is, and I'm sure you've talked about it on the podcast before, um, you know, you're, you're building skill, you're overcoming challenges by building skills in your life. Right. If you have too much challenge at first, like if you're trying to memorize something that's out of your, uh, you know, ability Right now, you haven't worked up to it. You'll get overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, if you're memorizing things that are too easy for you, just simple, and and your exercises are very uh, basic, uh, you might get bored. Mm -hmm. And so the optimal <laughs> place, the optimal place, is to be in the flow state, and it's right between those where you're you're building uh, skills to overcome challenge, and you have just enough challenge to build that new skill and to grow. So, so I was working with this one guy and he was struggling with a, an association where he would walk in the house, empty house, and he would, uh, go right to porn. And, uh, so we were kind of working with him, thinking about things that he wanted to build in his life, what kind of skills, what things he liked. You know, a lot of guys who get really zeroed in on porn, they lose all of their leisure activities. I'll ask them, what do you like to do in life? And they're, they're struggling with hobbies. They're struggling with, I have a couple hours. What do I do? Like they, they've, they don't read anymore. They don't, they're not, they're not lifelong learners. They're not right. learning. Mm. They've kind of got stuck. So I'm trying to re-engage those activities sometimes in, in helping them. So this guy said, Hey, I used to play guitar. Right. And my job right now, um, I think he was in ministry, didn't have anything to do with music. But he and I said, well, what would it be like if you, you know, put in your plan that you your recovery plan that you're going to work on some guitar uh, playing, you know, and I know you're a musician. And so he he got his guitar, he got it tuned up and strung, restrung and started practicing. And um, and so. At the same time, he was building other skills into his life to overcome some of the challenges that he uh, figured out. You know, some of the some of the things he was uh, vulnerable to. And he told me this experience that it was about six months later. He's he comes home to an empty house. It's like a Friday night. His wife and kids aren't there. And his first thought is, "Wow, I have time to practice my guitar right now, and I won't bother anybody." Right. You know, and so he had completely reassociated that coming home uh, threat with or that habit to to now the guitar. And in, and in some ways, that's a lot of of my work is is helping guys, um, you know, break a habit by making new habits. Right. And uh, one of the things that interests me about your uh, magnetic memory method is um, I read um, deep work by um, Cal Newport. A couple of years ago, and in it, he has a very basic memory palace exercise. Right, right. And and I remember um, sitting down with a deck of cards, and I didn't feel bold enough to do all fifty-two cards, but I, I memorized like half a deck right. by by using my by using my own house as a memory palace and and uh, memorizing the order of the cards. 
And uh, I just was doing it to challenge myself to see if I could build a skill and overcome that challenge. And, uh, uh, and I did. And so it was, um, I was, I was kind of interested in, Hey, what kind of techniques would memory, uh, work? Uh, how, how might it help my clients and some of the guys I work with? Do you have any ideas maybe how it might help them? Yeah, actually I was thinking about this and you know, it's something that I, I do myself. I'll just reach over now and right here is a deck of cards and it's, and there's a base over there as well. And those things are between the door and the computer. And uh, I learned this a long time ago because I'm also a card magician. But if you have a deck and you want to learn a new move, you actually have a deck just right there. So you pick it up and you, and you execute the move, right? So every time you pass it, and that's how you begin to just get this automatic motor skill development sort of thing. So, you know... And, and then in terms of my computer, when I'm writing a new book or whatever, it, it's not, I just don't randomly leave my computer, but I leave my computer with the document up, you know, ready to, to go. Uh, so that that's the first thing I see. Now, that's not a guarantee. It's not bulletproof that you're not going to skip off and do something else. And I have other things like writing on devices that don't go to the internet. But when I am working, because like, sometimes I have to do research and find links and yada, yada, then I just leave that barrier so to speak the progress barrier um and another thing is 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 just journaling so i always have a journal right next to my computer and after we do this i'm gonna write in there um interviewed matt you know and i just sort of yeah. tracking my activities so that i can look back at the end of the day and see where my time went with as much specificity as possible has been huge for me and you remember more of what you did during the day. And uh, so that's a beautiful thing. And then just having a large learning project. So there's like mini blasts of activities like memorizing cards and then learning a language or studying some books or doing both, like books related to a particular field, memorizing the terminology, the historical figures, the dates, etc. around that. And having those things, it's like a phalanx. Uh, you know that word phalanx of... Uh, yeah of Wait, no, uh, of activities that get yeah so you know those movies like Troy or whatever and you see the advancing soldiers and how that they they arrange their shields in such a way that it creates kind of like a a horizontal pyramid against the enemy attacks so there'll be one right. shield at the beginning and then a row of shields that that in a sort of chiron or um, you know arrowhead for a formation just protects massive amounts of soldiers behind them and they all sort of get under this phalanx of uh shields that are arranged right, right. and so if you have like this habit chain or habit phalanx then you've always got this thing to do that's other than you know something <laughs> something you shouldn't be doing because you're so involved in it and immersed in it and so you know instead of negative thoughts or thoughts about things you shouldn't be doing it's just kind of like oh i've got to do this or i've got to go read this because that's going to add more to my learning project etc and you're just kind of like in the flow to go back to mihai cheek sent mihai yeah no i think that makes a lot of sense um and i i um i think a lot of guys get really stuck because they're not they've kind of stopped Mm. cultivating and growing right and 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 one other thing too that um you know i think you you have been asked a lot of questions about nofap because they talk a lot about the brain you know they talk about you know there's a famous uh, there's a famous website called your brain your your brain on porn right. which catalogs all the research around um, neuroscience and porn and porn behaviors, porn addiction. And, uh, so there's a big emphasis on the brain. Right. And, um, but one of the things that I have a big emphasis on is, is that a lot of this behavior, even when it feels obsessive and, and almost automatic is, is emotion driven. Mm. And so, like, you were talking about journaling. I'm, hey, I, hey, I interviewed Matt today. One of the things I'm trying to get guys to do is to really capture, what am I feeling today? Right, right. 
you know, what were some of the powerful feelings that came up? Because those are usually indicators of vulnerability. If, if we start drawing a lot of associations between saying feeling lonely or isolated and acting out with pornography, if you can start to capture ahead of time, anticipate I'm feeling rejected today or I'm feeling lonely, then there's more chance that you could put in that, that habit if you don't already have it. I mean, I think your, your idea, and I, I did a, a great, uh, a great podcast. I, I did a good podcast, um, about four or five months ago called mindless recovery, not mindful, but mindless. <laughs> and it was all about building habits in that are pre-scheduled, pre-committed. They're already on the calendar. They're already part of your, your day. And so you don't have to walk into a tempting situation and go, what am I going to do? You know exactly what to do. Right. Um, you, you've already predetermined the outcome. And so mm-hmm. all you have to do is just show up a lot of times. And, right. and, um, and so that's one thing that I've worked on too, is like going, you know, tracking emotions, tracking some of our feelings. And then also what are things that we can put on your calendar? What are types of activities that are really going to stimulate you and keep you in the flow state. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting because, and it's where our work relates a lot. It's just about creating systems so that you can, it's not so much, I would, I, I'm sure that podcast is great, but I wouldn't call it mindless, but it's actually like being mindful in advance um, in, in some sense, so that you don't have to be mindful in that moment. You just, oh, there's a routine for this. There's a strategy for this. And then at the very least, you have clarity on yes, I followed the system or I didn't instead of just you know going with you know random chaos in life, which even chaos is rarely chaotic. It's usually some sort of system. If I understand some of the things that you said, there's just that autopilot is actually a trained you know behavior that is deeply instantiated over time due to habit or addiction, uh, even if we don't need to distinguish those terms necessarily. Yeah, I get asked the question all the time. One of, one of the most asked questions I get is, Matt, how do I deal with temptation in the moment? Mm. And, and I, I have kind of come to the, to the feeling that, um, that dealing with temptation in a moment that's completely unexpected, that's totally out of left field, is very difficult for someone who hasn't built any skills. Right. So it's much easier for us to go, well, let's not think about trying to get you right now to be to make the perfect decision at the at the at the precipice of temptation. Right. Let's spend our energy, you know, planning and predetermining the outcomes you want and pre committing. Mm. That's gonna get us a lot more um, that's gonna get us a lot farther along than just trying to get you to distract yourself or to make a different decision, to make your brain make a different decision in the moment. Um, I see a lot of, you know, a lot of guys act out on Friday night. That seems to be the, that seems to be the, well, at least guys who work, you know, during the week, that seems to be the place where any sort of stress that's accumulated, uh, any fatigue from work, Right. Any sort of, you know, sort of shows up on Friday night for some reason. You know? <laughs> Historically, I think that's pre-internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, sometimes Saturday night. Um, and so, but I'll say a lot of times to guys, if you want to be successful on Friday night, what you, you know, what habits are you doing on Wednesday morning? Right. Because that's when you have the chance to kind of anticipate. That's when you have the chance to maybe have a check-in with a friend and, kind of talk about some of those feelings that are coming up that are kind of cum- accumulating. Maybe talk about maybe some of the vulnerability that you might have because of fatigue or whatnot. You know, uh, I've worked with, interestingly enough in my work, I've worked with guys from professions to industrial jobs, all different sorts of things. And uh, one of the guys I worked with um, worked, um, I think, in either nuclear energy or oil and um, they actually track how many hours a guy's worked over a period of time because he's vulnerable to cumulative fatigue. If he right. works, say, 14 days in a row, a certain amount of hours, 
there's this point where he's going to start making more mistakes. He's going to be making more errors. Right. Um, and the, the same is true with guys who are in recovery. It's like if you're running at a level of fatigue, even in your job, um, and you're not having any self-care, at some point you will revert back to the old behavior because you know, it's just, it's, it's unmanageable, untenable to keep at that level. Right. Um, especially when you have limited skills, because yeah. a lot of the guys who I start working with haven't done anything other than try to quit, just, just resolve to quit. Right. Um, but they haven't taken any actions. Right. I want to ask a little bit about this difference between addiction and habit, not to try and solve it, but I'm curious in my own experience, when I was younger, they told me I had bipolar disorder. And being the scientifically minded person that I was, even at that young age, I was, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay, I've got this and made it part of my identity and spent 16 years trying different medications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I bought into the whole story. And at the end of the day, I don't take any medication now at all for years, totally clean from the, the addiction to my own uh, diagnosis, right? And I don't identify with that anymore. But for so long, it actually was the prisoner, or it was, I was the prisoner to the terminology almost, and uh, obeyed all kinds of dogma, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm wondering, in terms of this realm, you know, how, how useful is that self identification, as opposed to some other strategy between addiction or or habits. Boy, that is a whole podcast right there. That, <laughs> that question, uh, but I'll. Well, we're going to get I'll, people I'll, listening to your podcast, but uh, yeah, I'll, the... I'll answer. I'll I'll answer that from a couple of different tacks. Um, I I described, uh, especially um, when I was first in recovery, I described. This is an addiction. Um, and I would actually sort of almost personify the addiction that this is sort of the addiction. This is the addiction's um, uh, thinking. You know, this is, this is, you know, when I'm in the addiction, this is what I, this is what I want. These are the ways I make choices. So I would almost give the, the addiction almost like it had this, this certain amount of power uh, in my life. But I don't think I've, I very rarely have, rec, rec, you know, called myself a porn addict. Like I wouldn't, and and I really don't like it when therapists call people addicts, mm. uh, porn addicts. It feels very defining, kind of like you being diagnosed for bipolar or being put that label on you, and then you you took on that identity. Um, I don't think that really serves recovery. No. Um, and so I, I mean, I'd rather say, I like to say recovering person, that feels like a good thing, you know, or someone, who, you know, cause recovering could mean that you're, you're constantly growing, mm -hmm. that, that there's always something to learn and something to improve. Right. Um, so, but anyway, that's one thing. Now, how do I think that, that I think that there's two reasons that addict became a popular word. I think that in, um, psychology, you know, it was used a lot in mental health to, to describe uh, a mental condition, you know, some sort of uh, – and, and, and a physical addiction to a substance. Right. And so one of the reasons why people don't like porn addiction as a phrase is because um, in the classic definition, they say, well, there's no substance. So I'm not ingesting anything, uh, no, you know, foreign substance into my body to – that's creating some effect in me. Right. Um, so I think I think that you know someone who was a, addicted to heroin would be be called an addict because they're in a state of addiction. If they don't get the heroin, um, you know they feel horrible and they they constantly are going to meet their addiction. Okay. So those are you know so that's one uh, way that's it's meant from that sort of medical kind of point of view. Then the other way that I think it's popularly used is an Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And, you know, everyone's seen on TV or been to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting where they say, hi, I'm Matt, I'm an alcoholic. It seems very definitive. Mm. If I have the, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous right here, you know, it refers to the alcoholic like it's a, it's a behavior, it's a person, it's a type of person. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is this book has a ton of recovery and a, a ton of like healthy sort of vision for where you're moving towards. Yeah. You know, one of the chapters is called A Vision for You, and it paints the idea of recovery. So it obviously does is not invested in keeping you stuck in sort of this passive addict mentality. Right. But it uses alcoholic. And so why do I think they use alcoholic? I think they use alcoholic um, to self-identify in meetings that they're part of the fellowship. Mm -hmm. That this is a fellowship of people who are alcoholic by nature. Right. That, that, that we discovered we were prone to this vulnerability. And so I think it's more of a group identity versus – um, a diagnosis. It's mm. more of it's more of like they're opting in, saying this is something I struggle with, and I'm showing up, and I'm taking my seat at the table, and I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Matt. That's I really feel like it's part of the fellowship um, that sort of definition. Um, so I, as I said, I I really like recovering person. That's that's what I like to focus on. I I say and I like talking about it in terms of an extreme version of a habit. Um, Dr. Thomas Horvath, uh, who's been critical of some of the 12-step stuff, um, not critical, he's actually supportive of it in some cases, um, but feels like there needs to be some alternatives to just one way of thinking about addiction. You know, he talks about it as an extreme version of a habit, and he's very solution-based, like trying to figure out not so much what are we going to diagnose it, but how, what tools and skills do we need to help the person, you know, get control? Mm. And um, and so that's kind of the way I look at it. That's one of the reasons why I skirt the line. Um, I have said addiction. I do say addiction. A lot of people search for addiction right. when they when they when they want help. Um, so I don't. I'm not opposed to the word, um, but I like to focus on habits. And I was much more motivated by, um, you know, Charles Duhigg's uh, The Power of Habit. Mm. I was much more interested in that right. than I was a book written by a psychologist about sex addiction. Right, right. I, I found much more value. And I've, I've told you this in the past. Uh, on my podcast, one of my favorite things to do is to read a book that is a self-help book or a business book or a book about learning a skill and um, apply it to recovery. I just did it this week. I did a podcast on John Wick, the okay. John Wick tr trilogy or, or uh, um, saga, and talked about how John Wick, not to give too much away, um, is fueled by some emotions, and it makes him make some bad choices. And... Um, um, and he has some mistaken beliefs that I think he constantly keeps, um, <laughs> keeps him stuck. And hey. so I talked about, uh, you know, so I love doing that because I think that's like a really healthy way to think about recovery and to, to make it more integrated with, you know, what you're learning in life and what you're experiencing. Right, right. Yeah, the, the the movie thing is is great. There's there's many many movies that have so many lessons you can learn from. So I gotta check out that episode uh, for sure. You know, s speaking about movies, since that you, you raised it, what about the issue of triggers and developing some skills around that? Because I can just imagine, I don't know, I have only seen the first John Wick movie, but I can just imagine somebody decides, okay, I'm going to deal with this problem. I'm going to get some strategies in place. But I absolutely love for, I don't know, uh, aesthetic reasons, movies by David Cronenberg, which, you know, are just hypercharged. Not only are they uh, going to have some sex in it, but it's like the weirdest possible, strangest sex that actually has this deep you know, philosophical message, which actually would, you know, 
have this libertarian sort of bent towards, you know, that, uh, whatever you, you gotta, you gotta, you, you just gotta live your life and weird, weird stuff. Right. So now <laughs> what are you, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? Like not watch movies anymore? Like say, say your job was, uh, was to watch movies, you know, <laughs> like how, how, how is, how do triggers and, and the kinds of just, I guess what I'm getting at is that something about this uh, issue is not really about addiction or habit at all. It's about the fact that humans are designed to procreate. And something, something about this is that all, all of human expression has some sort of sexuality in it, etc. So if avoiding triggers can't be the strategy uh, at the end of the day, but you might want to have some strategy if you are triggered and movies would certainly be one of those things. Anthony Medebe, this is a, uh, I, I, this is not the longest question I've been uh, ever asked, but, but perhaps close to it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that I think ha has to be taken into account to a, to a recovering person as they start to identify what are the threats in their life and threats, a simple definition of threats, or you can say challenges, it doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't always have to be negative are situations where I need tools. And so, you know, media, visual media, especially if you're vulnerable to porn addiction or porn dependence, you might be more sensitive to sexual content. Right. And so you have to ask yourself, what is going to keep me safe? Not, not what's something that's going to be like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so stimulating, I'm just going to have to go act out. I think that's what we think of when we think of a trigger. You know, that triggered me. She triggered me the way she was dressed, you know, or whatever. But I like to, to think about it more in what's safe and what's unsafe. Mm. Um, and I also like to take ownership of I'm trying to recover and I'm trying to do this journey. So what's going to be the best use for me, what's going to be the best type of thing for me, um, the best habit, and what's what what can I look at internally first versus what's external? Right. You know, um, I work with a lot of um, religious people. Uh, I'm a Christian, and so a lot of Christians are attracted to me. But the more I talk about spirituality, I've had a lot of other people from conservative religions reach out to me and, and they'll describe really struggling with objectifying women in public and they'll put it on the woman, the woman's dressed a certain way mm. and that's triggering me. That's very passive. That's very passive that her body and her, however she chose to dress today is triggering you, meaning you're completely almost helpless. Like, right. um, you have to look at her body. You have to whatever respond. You know, it, it's this very passive uh, thing. And and so, um, what I, you know, what I try to do with guys is try to help them to take ownership. Well, what is it about her body that's drawing you to it? Mm. What associations have you made in fantasy and in your porn use that have made it really hard for you to just see her as a person? Right. You know, what, what habits do you always, for example, do you always scan her body as a, like trying to see whether it's acceptable to you? Mm. Is she an acceptable image to you? You know, so many guys have gotten used to being on the computer, even in dating apps where you, you know, you swipe left. I don't even know which way you swipe, but you know, if you're not, if you don't like someone's picture, you swipe left or right, you know, to get rid of them. And I think guys are walking through life doing the same kinds of mind things. Their, their, their brains are just sort of free associating. They see a woman's body. They start looking at the different parts of her. Uh, they're walking almost around passively, almost reacting to everything that comes in their path. Right, right. So a lot of what I try to help encourage and what I do is I try to be as present as possible. So if I'm walking down the street – and a woman who even is attractive comes to me, I try to first recognize her as a person. 
I'll say hello sometimes, which seems counterintuitive, right? right? The the old sort of Christian logic would be, well, I'm I might lust after her, so I need to treat her like kryptonite. I need right. to look away from her. But I've found it the opposite. I need to say hi, make eye contact, be bold to stay present and then not withdraw into myself. Right. Uh, my One of my favorite writers, C.S. Lewis, said the whole purpose of life, the whole meaning of life is to draw, to come outside of ourselves, outside of our own little prison, uh, to to connect meaningfully uh, with others. And, and he talked about it first as sex, is kind of like that's the highest expression of connection and intimacy and w- drawing outside of yourself. And uh, whereas masturbation, porn activities are very self-focused, very withdrawn. So a lot of guys are walking around with that sort of passive withdrawn state in that passive withdrawn state. So part of moving forward is taking ownership for the things that trigger you right, and right. saying, is this safe or not? Taking ownership by the way you respond to certain things. So your original question about David Cronenberg movies, um, I can't say that I've seen a David Cronenberg movie. Um, I want to see Seven maybe is one of them. That's David is Fincher, that? but close. And Fincher, Im- Fincher. And Im- impressive you remember the name David Cronenberg if you give, haven't seen give one me of a Chrono, movies. Give me a Chrono- Cronenberg movie. You probably have. Uh, uh, Requiem for a Dream? No, that's Aronofsky. Uh, okay, Aron- okay. Uh, but all Ds, Darren Aronofsky. Um, so Cronenberg, he's really famous for these movies like The Fly, Existence, Crash. Crash is a is basically car, car crashes and pornography. Like it's a, I wouldn't say it is pornography, yes. but it's a pornographic movie, and uh, it, it it celebrates it in a certain sense. Um, Naked Lunch. Uh, you know, there, his first okay, movie I- was Shivers, and it has this really. In- intelligent line which is that sex is the invention of a clever venereal disease <laughs> so i've always sort of loved that line and it just came to came to my mind as one of these extra potent movies that is mainstream but also fringe at the same time so i don't know if any yeah. of those titles uh yeah ring a bell. so 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 that um that does ring a bell and uh, i did see the fly i do remember that but um and i and i think i know why i confused him with uh, Fincher. But um, what I've kind of realized is that I'm very sensitive to content. And the more that I've gotten recovery, the more sensitive I've gotten. Um, I've gone to a couple of plays and I, I now I have a habit of anticipating. I'll read about what the content is um, in a play or a movie ahead of time to, to find out whether it's safe for me. Right. Um, so, so for example, I went to see a play where there was childhood sexual abuse, and it was just inferred off stage. But I'm very sensitive. Mm. Um, I I don't know if there was. Uh, I don't have any abuse memories, but I'm very sensitive to childhood sexual abuse. So, um, I was traumatized coming out of the play. Right. My wife was talking to me, and I, I, as a, I was actually short with her, and it led to a fight. And later I had to go back and say, listen, I came out of that play, and I was shaky. Hmm. You know, I was, I was really stirred up by some of that content. Right. Um, I saw another play with, um, oh, this was such a, a great opportunity. I got to see a play with um, Sandra O. Oh. Oh wow! Uh, one of my wife's Korean American, one of our favorite actresses. Right, right. In the play, um, she was playing an Argentinian woman um, who had been in prison, and there was there was rape, there was tr- trauma, sexual trauma in it. Again, off sc- off stage, I, I was traumatized by it, and I could sense it coming. Right. You know, the maybe it's the porn sensitivity in me like i used to be able to find porn i used to you know kind of anticipate where i could potentially find porn mm. I, I almost could feel like my spidey sense in the play i'm like uh oh i should have read about this play i know something's going to happen right i know where this is going so i'm very sensitive so so um 
I've let go of a lot of movies and filmmakers um, mm. because of that very reason. Right. Um, I, I can think of, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, of some other, um, David Lynch, for example. Yeah, he's um, pretty over the top, too. Yeah, he? David Lynch. Um, um, I'm trying to think, who did the movie um, Spring Breakers? Um mm. Uh, and kids, um, Harmony. Oh, Harmony uh, Kareen, yeah. Yeah, Harmony Kareen. Um, I like. I I I understand why mm. it's art. I even understand maybe some of the the things that um, propel them to to film it. Like I don't I don't uh, immediately label it pornography. Right. I do think it, I do think it's art. But it's not safe art for me, right? Right. Yeah. And so I've I've had to let go of some of that stuff. Um, and you know what's funny, Anthony? The 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 porn addict part of me, the the addiction part of me says, "Oh, you're giving up. You're depriving yourself." Mm. But there's so much other art that I can enjoy and yeah. love. There's a endless amount of things that I can pursue and love and grow and obsess over in a healthy way um, that it's really a very small portion. But that that is one of the things. And I see this a lot with guys. Um, early on, they're struggling. They're saying, Matt, um, I, you know, I keep acting out with my smartphone. I can't get control over it. Right. And I'll suggest, you know, well, what about you know, using a dumb phone for a while. Oh, I could never, <laughs> you know, I could never, I got an email from a guy who said, Matt, I'm really struggling, but I love Netflix and I just feel like I won't have anything to do in my life. If I get rid of my Netflix account, hmm. I'll just, I, what will I do with my boredom? That was the question. If I get rid of Netflix and and I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I, I think what you need to do is I've, I always first say, well, look to see what restrictions you can add to make it safer. Right. If that doesn't work, then look at eliminating it for a time. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's some things that maybe we eliminate for a time and we grow skills, we overcome the challenges and we're able to reintegrate it into our lives. I mean, the, the latest book by Cal Newport, Digital Minimalism, kind of teaches this idea of taking a 30-day fast from um, from digital tech dependence and then, you know, s systematically adding it back in. And he has a, a philosophy of technology use that you sort of adopt and create for yourself. Um, so I think that could work. So sometimes there's integration, but sometimes things are just unsafe. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a TV show that I um, was told about by people from work. This is a few years ago. And it was one of those water cooler shows where every day, every day after the show talked about it, they'd talk about it. And they say, Matt, you love film. You love movies. You'll love this, this show. So I, uh, I watched the first episode and, um, there's a, it's, a it's about a, it's about a, a serial killer. And, um, and so there's sexual trauma in it. There's mutilation. There's a couple of just very graphic things that they show. Um, and I turn it off. And I, again, like the plays, I'm haunted by it. Right. I'm haunted by some of these dark feelings, the, 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 the kind of isolation, the ultra isolation of, this, of the main character. Right. Also, I'm struck by his psychosis, right? Um, you know, or by, by his um, sociopathness, like her. And it... it it just arouses a lot of feelings in me and I, and I realize, and, but I'm still drawn to it because it was a good story. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still tempted to watch episode two. And I saw some good friends, um, that weekend who know me really well. And I shared that I had watched this and I shared 
even some of my thoughts and struggles since watching it. And they say, Matt, that show's never going to be safe for you. Mm. There's never going to be a time that, you know, casual serial killing and <laughs> mutilation and sexual trauma is going to be just okay for you. And it was okay. sad. It was sad thinking of that, that there's this vulnerability or weakness in me that I can't see these cool shows that people talk about. But at the end of the day, there's other stuff for me to pursue and, and it keeps me safe. And it, and the, the more you stay away from things that really trigger or traumatize you, the less craving you actually have, right. you know, actually engaging some of that material, trying to, trying to sort of skirt around it actually can create obsessive thinking can create um, patterns where you're starting to get pulled back in. Right. So, um, so I don't do it. So I stay away from stuff like that. And, um, uh, in other places I challenge myself to use skills like being present and saying hello or, you know, making eye contact and being very intentional. Mm. I think it was a long answer. No, I think it's, it's a, it's a perfect one. And I was sort of, I, I, uh, for audio purposes, I don't want anybody to think I was laughing in the, uh, in the laughing sense that I think it's funny. Uh, I was laughing with a kind of recognition because, uh, and this may relate to some of the impulses that people have with, uh, with pornography, is years ago I had to have therapy for harm OCD because just completely driven crazy with impulses to jump off bridges and all kinds of bizarre stuff. Yeah. And I didn't believe the guy for a second when he told me, do you think there might be something with your career that, uh, that is causing or is involved in this? And it's like, what are you talking about? I'm a film professor, you know, and all I do is watch David Lynch and David Cronenberg. I did a course on David Cronenberg movies, right? And all yeah. I'm doing is watching weird crap all day long with people doing all kinds of stuff. I, d I did a whole research project on serial killer movies, etc. And, what am I doing? I, like, I, I kid you not, I had to board up the window in my office because I couldn't stop thinking of jumping out the window. Uh, and it's not even thinking about it. It's like, go, 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 go. So maybe I did have bipolar disorder after all. But, you know, at the end of the day, there was no medicine that took care of this, etc. So, you know, I, I've now seen the wisdom of that because... I, I really can't watch these movies anymore uh, as much as I might like to. And the odd time I'll throw one on and I get, I, I asked just what was so fascinating to me about this in the first place. Um, even though I still enjoy the aesthetics of it and the weird ideas, I love all that stuff, but it's, it's that I don't love it actually, you know, anymore uh, because it, it really does have that consequence and I never would have believed it, but there is, there is something to the garbage in garbage out kind of thing. Even if you don't put out garbage you know, you're, you're percolating things that might just not be what you want in your brain. Uh, cause it can be a, be a strange life to lead <laughs> internally. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm always encouraging guys to think about is, you know, who do they want to be? What, what kind of man do they want to be? What, you know, I work, uh, I work with men directly. There's obviously women who listen to my podcast, but um, you know, sometimes partners, sometimes people who's uh, women who struggle with pornography, but I'm always encouraging people to think about where they're going and w what kind of life do they want to create for themselves? Who do they feel called to be? Mm. And sometimes when you start asking those questions, the urgency of watching, you know, game of Thrones or some other thing and it. it I've just, pulled that out of a hat at random, but you know, whatever it is, it doesn't seem to line up as much with where a lot of guys see that, you know, where their focus is or where they really want right. to be. Um, so it's a, it's a little sacrifice to give up some of these things. Um, I don't feel, uh, I, I don't feel deprived at all. I, um, um I was going to show you a book I do with it. Oh, it's on the floor. I have uh, the the book by Francois Truffaut about Hitchcock, right? Right. Um, where he interviews him for like three or four days with the translator, and they talk about um, all of Hitchcock's movies. One thing I did 
um, about a year or two ago is I started going systematically through the book, which is uh, chronological, and I would rent each Hitchcock film. Um, and um, obviously Hitchcock was visual. I mean, there's sexual content, there's inference, there's plenty of things that could actually be even triggering to me. Mm. Uh, even though they're old, you know, it's still triggering. Right. Um, on some level, uh, I have to watch with a lot of intention and be careful. But um, endlessly fascinating. Mm. Yes. Uh, I'm in a, I'm in, a, you know, I'm in a movie uh, Slack group with some other friends of mine, and um, you know, peop- we've been talking about, um, you know, um, a lot of old cinema. Uh, so there's so many movies I could watch. We got together a couple of weeks ago and watched, uh, um, let's see, which was it? Um, Rashomon by All Kurosawa. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and, it, you know, it's like there's, I, I, I mean, film in particular, there's so many things I can look at and watch. Um, I did watch something really interesting recently, though, that was incredibly triggering but also, I cried in it. Um, I watched a movie that was really hard for me to watch because I looked away probably a hundred times in this movie. Um, it was a documentary called "The Artist Is in um, uh, the Artist." The artist is in session. Hold on, let me check. Um, it was by a, perf- a famous performance artist. Oh, is this where she meets her her ex husband or her ex ex uh, partner? Yeah, yeah, that's that's in there. Um, yeah, she had a she had a partner. Um, the artist is present. It's uh, Marina uh, M. And uh, let's see, I can't say her last name. Oh, uh, Ambrovic. Mm. And um, it, it, it kind of culminates with uh, an installation she did at MoMA in New York where she sit, sat for months and um, gallery or people coming to the museum could come and sit across from her. Mm. And she would, sit, um, she would sit in this position making eye contact not moving, um, but trying to be present with every person who sat in front of her uh, all day long. And some of the pictures of this installation brought me to tears. Some of the, not some of the video, um, Mm. because you could tell she was really present, um, in a way that disarmed even people who, thought they might, you know, were kind of looking to have an experience. They were still disarmed by how present she was. Okay. Um, but they show a lot of her visceral work um, as a young performance artist, and a lot of it involved nudity and sex and and the installation, you know, stuff. And so I, it really was triggering because I was like, I was really wanting to take in the whole documentary, but I, I had to like, try to watch it in a a safe way possible. Right, right, right. Um, So it's like I – but I'm happy I did watch that piece, but I can't recommend it. I would never talk about it on my podcast (laughs) because it just – it just was – there was just so many things about it. And and, Mm. and, and the way they edited it too, it was a lot of jump cuts and quick things. So I really couldn't even anticipate things. You know, sometimes in movies you can anticipate uh, sexual content. In this one it was just like – all, all over the place. I, I probably would have done better listening to it, you know, like right. a podcast. But you know, yeah, that's interesting. And that, that now that you mentioned it, it is it is a strategy that I I've used with watching certain things, just closing my eyes and listening to it. And any any decent film will be something that you can listen to, because uh, any filmmaker or film student knows that ninety percent of cinema is the sound. So, unless it's silent film, <laughs> right? <laughs> Even then, <laughs> there might be a piano somewhere in the room. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, we've sort of gotten off the off the tracks and into the weeds, as uh, as some people say on their podcasts. But uh, I, I think that that's probably one of the most important directions to go because we're just talking about the experience of what it is to be an animal, essentially, and an animal that's now fused with a technological landscape that has not so much made anything new, but hyper exaggerated accessibility to all of human production and made it possible to develop new habits. And I think one of the great themes of what you're doing and what your work is, is, is defanging those habits by finding better ones. So, you know, what is, what ultimately at the end of the day, would you say is the number one thing that someone who's struggling with any of these problems that we've talked about today can do in addition to obviously going to recoveredman.com and checking out your podcast, uh, what can they do to, um, I hope I remembered your website correctly there. Correct me if I you was did. wrong. Oh, good. You did. <laughs> but you know, what's, um, what's the biggest lever to pull or the biggest button to push if that's even to, possible to, to nail to, down? To get, to get the most leverage, it, you need connection, hmm. especially in recovery. I mean, I, I don't know of anybody who's recovered from a, a strong dependence on pornography who hasn't done it with connection. So that's definitely the first step. Even telling someone important in your life that you're struggling is really important to to help you start to, to even be honest about what's going on. Um, be, and then... You know, people, especially healthy people in recovery, you know, people who are in recovery or people who are working a plan of recovery, you know, they're they're going to be the best people to help um, you with pre-commitment and with with making an, an actual recovery plan because, um, you know, you might tell your wife that you're struggling with this, and while it helps you to be honest, she doesn't have tools for you mm. to help walk it out, and if anything, it might kind of traumatize her. Right. So while it's important to tell her from an honesty point of view in terms of uh, getting recovery, it's helpful to have some other people in your life to support you. But, you know, you can get that sometimes in recovery groups. Sometimes you can get that through a good friend who struggles. Um, and out of that relationship, then that's where I really recommend creating a recovery plan. And a recovery plan is where you start to own some of these things that we've talked about. What are the threats in your life? Right. Uh, what are the mistaken beliefs that you're prone to believe on Friday night when you're alone? Uh, what are some of the weak links? What are some of those things in your life that make it easy to go to porn over and over? And systematically looking for tools for each one of those. You know, what do I do when I'm stressed out? What do I do when I'm bored? How do I create some habits to... Um, to deal with mistaken beliefs. So there's a lot of people who struggle with self-hatred. Right. Um, and so when someone's feeling not good enough or rejected all the time, it's really hard to say, well, give up this one source of comfort that you have. Mm, um, yeah. So we need to look for ways for people to find comfort and, and security and certainty outside of porn behaviors. Right. Um, so... Um, so making and then you know also making a plan is coming up with a why, figuring out why. Well, how does this really cost you? Is it your confidence? Is it is it deep down? Is it your um, sense of self? Um, how is it injuring you? Right. Um, sometimes guys have a hard time seeing this, but if I ask enough questions, we start to get down to the bottom of things. Um. I, a good a good example is um, I'll say, how does porn cost you? And some guys will say, well, it, my anxiety and my depression. And I'll say, oh, that's interesting. I said, um, um, what, did you have anxiety and depression before porn? And, and they all, 95% of the time they say yes. Right. So, so I said, oh, well, then porn is your escape then. And it's your solution. 
but you're in conflict about it and it brings shame and it brings stuff that you didn't expect and it maybe creates more anxiety. For example, if you're procrastinating over a paper you have to write and then you you use porn to deal with that anxiety and then you waste another six hours, now you're six hours more in the hole with the original problem, so it creates more anxiety. The truth is, though, porn is the solution in that case. And so um, we need, it's not, the cost is not anxiety. It's, uh, it's, it's that porn is not really solving that problem. Mm. So we have to kind of refocus on that. Um, but there's other cases where a guy will say the biggest cost to him is time. But it's not that he's wasting time. He could, he could spend, you know, hours memorizing things, and it'd be a very restorative process and helpful, and you know, give him new skills. Mm. But what he's describing is when he compulsively looks at porn and he's not planning on it, and he wastes so- several hours. He's left, and he, and he had resolved to not do it. He feels like his time was hijacked and out of his control, and that leads to a, an erosion of confidence. So the problem isn't really the cost of time. The problem is is that it leads to this confidence, you know. Right. Uh, the problem isn't really um, anxiety. It's that the procrastination and some of the things that we do in porn leads to more anxiety and and also that lack of confidence, you know. So there's, you know, so there's that. Those are some of the big ones right there of of kind of you know, pulling apart those mistaken beliefs and those, those systems that are influencing the way we do the things we do. Well, I love all that because it really focuses everyone on the real deal, which is asking the right questions and making sure that those questions are, you know, targeted to producing the right kind of answers. And I really appreciate all the work you do in this area and appreciate all your wisdom today. So what's coming up next for you and where can people find out more to connect with your podcast and the great things you do to help people? Well, uh, a couple of things. I, I work uh, on the podcast Porn Free Radio every week and um, I've just launched a, a special podcast for my Patreon subscribers um, called Coffee with the Dauber. I'm known for drinking coffee on almost all of my podcasts <laughs> and um and so this podcast is a little more informal but i'm actually talking about just things i'm learning in recovery um i've uh, i've recovered from my porn addiction and have tools to keep safe um, but i'm um, in recovery for some food related stuff right now and i have a food plan and a sponsor related to that so i'm learning uh, new tools in that area Wow. Uh, I'm also writing a book, and I've struggled a lot with procrastination and habits uh, around writing the book and fears. Uh, and so I'm pressing into that, and and that's actually providing a lot of um, learning for me and, and things that I can bring back to the audience. Um, so a couple of the last podcasts I did, um, I mentioned specifically some of my struggles with food and writing that um, – that I'm bringing back to, to the discussion of porn and porn behaviors. Wow. Very, very cool. So that's all at recoveredman.com and your podcast yeah, and is the there pod- and everything. Yeah. The podcast is everywhere. Spotify, um, Apple iTunes or Apple podcasts, Google podcasts. And, uh, I, I think I told you this last time we talked, I, I just got accepted to iHeartRadio, radio, which is the American right, right. pop radio station. And, uh, so you can listen to Taylor Swift and Beyonce and then click over to, uh, to Porn Free Radio. Nice. And I know you're a huge Taylor Swift fan, right? Well, you know, actually, <laughs> she's an incredibly talented songwriter. And uh, she's she's a very interesting person to, to follow in terms of mar- the marketing of music and how she brings her fans in with like special releases that actually explain like she sits and talks with the producer about the songwriting process. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I don't have, I don't, you know, have uh, some great deep fascination for, for her music at the end of the day, but I really admire the work that she's doing and she can certainly spin a tune and 
use the actual craft of songwriting to bring people in. It's amazing to me, actually. So, well, I'm sure <laughs> I, I, I just was kidding because I, I know you, you played in bands and stuff. So, uh, but I know you played in a diverse group of bands. So, um, so Indeed. no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I like, I, I, you're trying to catch me out or something. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was trying to throw you off, but uh, <laughs> that's cool. Well, you have to dig deeper into, into the, uh, the fringes of pop culture. As a professor of mine once said, the actual center is the fringe. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a, I'm, I'm as mainstream as it, as it gets, even if I insist that it's all radical and strange <laughs> all the same. <laughs> right. So, but yeah, I mean, what can I say? I'm amazed that, you know, people can access you so readily and anybody, any of us on, uh, on the, as they're driving or whatever. And, uh, you know, I guess that's sort of a last kind of thing to, to, to talk about. You mentioned broadband when we, when we started, what do you think the future is going to be for, for this weird and wild adventure that we're having on the internet? Do you, what, what, like in your most honest, uh, mind of minds and heart of hearts, where do you think this is going? Are we going to solve these riddles or is it just spiraling into into a black hole well i'll say something that that um some of the podcast listeners have said to me that they were really overwhelmed by pornography and specifically the technology that delivers it and the same technology that delivered the pornography is now delivering a, a place of hope Right. Um, all of my groups are virtual. I mean, I've had guys in Australia where you are right. in my groups and, and they have powerful experiences of being seen and known through a Zoom chat with eight or nine other guys. Right. All in different time zones. So, you know, there's a famous TED talk a few years ago, you know, where they talk about the opposite of addiction is connection. It's a little cliche now. But I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand that the very tools that have isolated me and led to me going further in my addiction have been the very same tools um, I've leveraged to, to not only help myself but help others. Right. So where is it going? It's probably going to be there's going to be good uses of technology and, and bad uses. And, um, and we're going to constantly need things as humans we're going to need love intimacy connection mm. uh, being known being seen those are things i don't think are going away right. uh, and if anything you know there's there you talked about um research and and statistics and stuff i mean um depression other types of things um social media anxiety those things are going up. So there are challenges that th that technology is creating. Um, and so I think, you know, we're, we're going to have to continue to, to look for ways to, to help people, you know, and it might be in different ways, kind of like who, you know, who would have thought we'd have podcasts on, you know, memory, mm -hmm. uh, learning and, and, you know, porn addiction recovery, you know, 15 years ago. Right. I don't I, I don't think I had even heard of a podcast until maybe 2012. No, 2011 maybe, 2010. Right, right. And even then I just thought it was some a way to get like sports talk or movie chat. Right. You know, I I didn't think, oh, this will be a place where you can talk about something vulnerable or help people who are really desperate but are too ashamed to to try to get help, you know. So right. Yeah, well, I see it that way pretty much myself. There's an ancient Greek word, pharmakon, which means the cure contains the poison and the poison contains the cure. That's where we get the word pharmacy for. And it always seems to me like the internet is exactly like that, a giant pharmacy filled with cures that can poison you and poisons that can cure. So, it's. I mean, it's been an incredible – I was in web development and web ma management and design for almost my whole career, marketing – before I started this venture uh, of of working full time with people in in the area of porn recovery, but uh, it's it's been an am an amazing part of my life uh, financially and and my own 
passions and interests. Right. Um, um, I, I found that when I got in recovery, I was actually better at being a web designer. Um, and I could solve complex problems right. because I remembered what it was like to be obsessive about trying to find porn or trying to, you know, um, act out. And uh, that same sort of um, obsessive energy could be chal- channeled into healthy things to improve software or improve websites or performance. Right. And um, I, I did that quite a bit. And I used to tell my, my wife that I'm using my, my dark powers for good now. Right. <laughs> um, and um, it's true. It really is true. And I, again, with the podcast stuff too, I think you know, a lot of what I do is very technical. And my previous experience, both doing um, porn and, and, and running my and being in corporate America have helped me uh, do what I do. Well, hey, I got I got to wrap up. I know you right, got to right, wrap yeah. up. Well, um, I'll keep this remembering obsession in mind, and memory wins the day again. It seems so. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your experience and uh, helping us solve this question with uh, what what the relationship here is between these issues, no fap, etc., and better memory. I really appreciate it, and let's talk again soon. Thanks, Anthony.